Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shared Value Initiative's Fireside Chat with Mark Schneider, CEO of Nestle, and Mark Kramer, Senior Lecturer at Harvard Business School and co-founder of FSG. I'm Bobby Silton, Managing Director of the Shared Value Initiative, and I'll be your host today. For those of you who aren't familiar with the initiative, we're a global platform for leaders seeking business solutions to address society's most challenging issues. We are a part of FSG, a not-for-profit social impact consulting firm that was co-founded by Professor Michael Porter of Harvard Business School and Mark Kramer. We want to thank all of you for being with us today. We had over 1,300 people sign up for this event, so clearly there's a lot of interest in this conversation. A little housekeeping before we get started today. This session is being recorded. And toward the end, we're gonna have an audience Q&A. So please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask your questions. And if you'd like to follow the conversation on social media, please use this hashtag and handle. Before we get to the main event, I did wanna share that we will be hosting our annual Shared Value Leadership Summit this November 8th, 9th, and 10th. This is a fully virtual event and it will be open to the public. We're gonna have three 90 minute sessions, um, three days in a row, and it's gonna focus on the private sector's role in creating a more just and equitable society. We'll have a conversation around economic inclusion, health access, and climate action. You can see the full agenda and register at sharedvalue.org starting next month in July, and we'll be sending out communications about that. Now let's get to today's program. Now more than ever, companies are being called upon to play a critical role in addressing the growing social and environmental challenges that we face. This is a decade that needs action, and we need more than just pledges to create sustainable change and to deliver more equitable outcomes for people around the world. We hope this conversation today will help illuminate some ways that companies can contribute to addressing our collective societal needs and we hope that this discussion also provides some inspiration for all of you leaders out in the audience. Nestle is a founding member of the Shared Value Initiative and has played an important role in the global shared value movement from the very start. This year, the company published its Climate Roadmap, an ambitious plan to transform its business and tackle climate change. Today, we'll learn about this plan and how Nestle is living into their ambitious goals. Now let me introduce our two speakers for today. Mark Schneider has served as the CEO of Nestle since January 2017. Through his leadership, the company has redoubled its commitment to a sustainable future and its efforts to live into its company's purpose, to unlock the power of food, to enhance the quality of life. As the world's largest food and beverage company, Nestle recognizes the increasingly important role that business has in creating a resilient future for people and planet. Mark Kramer is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, the co-founder of FSG and senior advisor to the Shared Value Initiative. Mark co-authored the seminal Harvard Business Review article, Creating Shared Value with Michael Porter in 2011, and he continues to push the global thinking on the role of business in society through his influential research courses and publications. So Mark Kramer, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I will join you and Mark at the end to close the event. Thank you, Bobby. And it is great to be here with such a uh, sizable global audience and always a pleasure, uh, Mark, to have a chance to catch up with you. Uh, you know, I have um, followed Nestle for more than a decade through uh, three different CEOs. And I really admired what you have been able to do in the few years that you've been at the helm, uh, both in terms of accelerating the pace of change within Nestle, uh, in terms of improving the basic business fundamentals, but also in terms of really launching a very ambitious plan around climate. So I guess I wanna start off my first question today is really about climate change and why do you see that as such an imperative for Nestle? And what progress has the company made so far? Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. And also thank you to the Shared Value Initiative for setting this up and uh, 
Also, thank you for everyone joining here. Huge amount of interest around the world, and we certainly uh, appreciate it. So when it comes to the topic of climate change, for a company that is a large user of agricultural products and always has been for the last 154 years, I think we have been staying in very close contact with um, fragile agricultural communities around the world. And we're seeing uh, some of the things happening that scientists have talked about for decades. And uh, we're seeing its real world implications and consequences. And uh, as such, uh, we feel a need in the interest of, uh, you know, all of us around the world and uh, also the safety of supply chains and uh, nutrition around the world to take action. And um, that's what led uh, very early on to a strong interest in uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, with the UN pledge opportunity coming up, uh, that was something that uh, very much uh, found our support. Let me also say that uh, this has been a very consistent and steadfast uh, commitment over the years. So even for the time, uh, for example, when the United States was uh, stepping out of the Paris Agreement, we were part of a movement uh, in the US uh, called We're Still In uh, to signal our full support. So this is not something that we uh, you know, adjust according to where the political winds are blowing from, but rather something we strongly believe in and that we steadfastly uh, pursue. Absolutely. And um, you know, the climate change issue is a longer term issue. It's certainly happening with greater speed than we ever anticipated, but it's still uh, a consideration over many years. And as I talk to other CEOs, they often uh, face challenges juggling those longer term issues against the short term performance expectations of shareholders quarter to quarter. How do you think about balancing the short term obligation to shareholders and the longer term obligation to the planet? Yeah. And look, I think with this question, you're touching upon one of the key issues that we're facing as uh, public corporations. And uh, this applies in particular, of course, to any investments related to um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But in many other forward-looking ways, it also applies to any investment spending towards the future. At the end of the day, if you apply a long enough time horizon, I think a lot of these uh, perceived contradictions go away, but in the very short term, they do exist. So any dollar I spent this quarter on anything that's forward looking that doesn't pay back immediately in this quarter is $1 less of profitability in this quarter. And uh, while many shareholders may take a longer view, there are some people who will be in our stock right now who are betting on this very quarter. And hence, uh, you know, when you look at the full spectrum, uh, the job of corporate management, in my view, is it to create a consensus around the larger shareholder groups in your companies about what it takes to ensure uh, longer term uh, success of the company, to balance that with near term expectations so that uh, the vast majority of shareholders is behind your plan, to then provide clear targets and metrics around that. And of course, full transparency when it comes to regular updates so that people see where you stand. When you do that, it doesn't matter whether you talk around about uh, climate change or whether you talk about uh, research and development spending, all that forward looking spending, it's all to me a matter of the kind of size, the metrics and the transparency. And um, if you handle that well, I think a lot of these perceived contradictions go away. That makes sense. And of course, the way you're handling it is through this net zero roadmap that I believe you announced about six months ago or so in December. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that, uh, what that roadmap actually is? Yeah. So that roadmap was published as part of our United Nations uh, pledge, which we took in September 2019. Um, as you know, on a 30-year project, the United Nations very early on, um, as part of their rules, uh, made it clear that they insist on what they call a time-bound plan, where you describe some of the intermediate steps and milestones, because otherwise uh, a long-term 30-plus year commitment uh, would have little credibility. Um, under the rules, you have two years after signing the pledge uh, to work out uh, such a time-bound plan. One of our early ambitions was not to use uh, the full two years because we felt that uh, this is a matter that has some urgency. 
And for, frankly, you know, in my business life, I've rarely seen plans getting better in the second year. So uh, we felt why not pull it off in one and uh, be out there uh, on a timely basis. We got a little bit delayed because of the uh, COVID um, um, issues, but by and large within 13, 40 months, we were out with this plan. And um, as expected, it focuses on the first decade and some of the milestones for the first decade, because this is the one where I think we have to create a dent in this uh, growth curve when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking fully incorporating our growth, we're looking for a 20% reduction by 2025 and a 50% reduction by 2030. And then of course, there's a continued client path towards net zero by 2050. Um, we also outlined some of the specific steps on how we get there. In our case, that's particularly important because a lot of that work um, rests outside of our own four walls with our upstream suppliers. Because this is literally, um, you know, from uh, the commodities we're using up to the shelf. Uh, so we have to incorporate a lot of upstream things. Um, the part of the greenhouse gas emissions that comes from inside our own four walls is, um, you know, frankly, around five percent or so. So it's 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 the smallest part of this. Working with hundreds and thousands of farmers and suppliers around the world to upgrade their practices to get there. That's the key challenge. And, and that is indeed quite a challenge. You know, in, in addition to the work you've been doing on climate, uh, there's always, of course, the question about the health impact of foods in the portfolio. And I know recently there was a Financial Times article that was honestly a bit embarrassing, saying that there was an internal document that suggested that about 60% of the portfolio did not actually meet certain health and nutritional guidelines. And uh, certainly from what I know of Nestle, that seems like uh, it was off the mark, but it was an internal document. So can you explain uh, that a bit? Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing this up because I think it gives an opportunity to uh, put the record straight. So I think as a company, as a food and beverage firm, early on, uh, we have been very um, interested in improving the nutritional profile of our food and beverage products. Uh, this goes back to the late 1990s and uh, my uh, pre-predecessor announcing at the time what's called the Nutrition, Health and Wellness Strategy, which we're still pursuing today. As part of that, and through a lot of diligent and patient work, um, we have taken over the years thousands of tons of uh, sugar and saturated fat and salt out of our products while maintaining uh, the taste profile that uh, consumers uh, expect. And we also worked, for example, in, in, in pioneering ways, especially in uh, low income countries to fortify our nutrition products. Uh, so for example, vitamin D or iron deficiencies, those are public health issues that we wanted to combat with this proactive measure. All of this in a voluntary proactive basis because we saw that need and we wanted to address it. So clearly uh, that path continues and uh, we stay very focused on it. Uh, the background to this internal presentation was a project that uh, I have initiated last year, and that is, as always, we want to keep our guidelines and metrics and targets updated on continuous improvement. And uh, so this is a review that's taken place this year. Um, this presentation found its way uh, to the media. Um, it was quoted a bit out of context in that it said that 60% of our products don't meet a three and a half star health star rating or better. Um, actually, when you then look at the article itself, it explains further down that um, only half of our products are considered in this case. Uh, some like for example, infant nutrition aren't because there's uh, special guidelines uh, covering those. So actually when you adjust it properly down as the article does later on, it's less than 30%, but with this out of context headline, it certainly made a lot of waves. It's important to look through all of this and really see the essence. And the essence is a company that does stay very much focused on uh, continuous improvement on the nutrition profile of its products. We're also adding very much um, through internal research and also through acquisitions, new and health focused uh, products to our lineup. But it's also important for us that we are in some categories that are essentially not so much nutrition focused, but rather 
uh, enjoyment and indulgence focus. So think about confectionery or ice cream. These are products which are not going to go away. And um, what we have there is rather a fairly stringent set of guidelines that make sure the enjoyment and the sensory experience is still there, while at the same time assuring that we are among the best in class in that category against our peers. So a piece of chocolate or ice cream is not perceived as you know, healthy, nutritious food per se. It's seen as an enjoyment. But I think you can still uh, cut out uh, as many of the negative ingredients as possible. Sure. And you know, I'm, I'm curious how you perceive the evolution of consumer tastes. Because on the one hand, I, I understand that some of the healthier products and foods are actually some of the fastest growing product lines you have. And on the other hand, I hear that sometimes when you take salt, fat, and sugar out of a product to make it healthier, uh, you actually lose market share. Uh, so on the one hand, consumers seem to want healthier food, and on the other hand, they don't. And, and how do you balance that as you think about the direction the company goes in product development? Yeah, and look, it seems to be contradictory, but uh, we sometimes find that in the very same consumer. So these days, as a result of what I call Dr. Google, everyone is so much more informed and educated about what constitutes good nutrition. And the interest of that is on the rise and clearly has received another boost uh, with the COVID crisis, no question about it. But then um, there is this other angle that I think we're all subject to, and that is we want to have enjoyment uh, through food and beverage. And by the way, if someone is too insistent, my usual pushback question is, well, tell me what you ate last week. And then, you know, <laughs> if someone gives a truthful account, then you see uh, that uh, food is not only about keeping ourselves alive and healthy, but it's also about uh, enjoyment. And uh, that's the part where I think there's other ways that we can contribute to health. So for example, by being fully transparent uh, when it comes to the information regarding ingredients, about giving helpful guidelines on portion sizes, portion control. Um, and so, yes, uh, the occasional intelligence, I think, is absolutely fine. When you look at many governmental guidelines around the world or nutritional guidelines uh, for a normal adult, a healthy adult, it seems that around 300 calories or so a day, uh, you know, they're very often described as discretionary. And so those don't need to be strictly uh, dedicated towards uh, sort of nutritional advancement. And so I think there's room for that. And there also seems to be a human need. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you, you've mentioned COVID a couple of times and I'm curious as we see things returning to normal, um, I know some companies, some organizations have found that there is a different way of doing things that COVID, that COVID sort of forced on them that they actually had some lessons that they've learned that they may incorporate going forward. I, I'm curious what Nestle's experience has been as you adapted to COVID and whether there were lessons there uh, for, for operating somewhat differently going forward. Absolutely, and um, I would point to two big ones. Um, one is, um, again, that uh, renewed interest in everything related to health and in particular to boosting the immune system. I think that's here to stay. Uh, because beyond COVID, and let's all hope that the COVID um, pandemic comes to an end very soon, I think each and every winter now with flu season, you'll have renewed interest in that because some of the main, some of the same forces are at work. Uh, so that's one major area I would point to, and that will probably, that's, that's here to stay. Second one is all things digital. So clearly, um, food and beverage was one of the categories that was somewhat slow to adapt to the digital world. Um, when we talked about this pre-COVID, uh, we tended to joke that when consumers go food shopping, they rather want to select the bananas themselves in order to tell the fresh ones from the not so fresh ones. Um, I think now that has changed. And under the immediate healthcare threat of this crisis, many people gave it a first time try. They liked what they saw. And they also came to appreciate the sheer convenience that's associated to that. And so I think your classic family Saturday morning shopping run, while it may still exist in some parts of the world, I think over time it'll ramp down a little bit and uh, digital uh, um, ways of shopping are on the way up. Interesting, interesting. Well, I wanna to return to climate uh, for a minute. Uh, obviously it is the existential issue facing our planet. 
Uh, you mentioned that only about 5% of the uh, emissions is within the walls of Nestle factories and operations. Most of it is really coming from the farming uh, that supplies the raw ingredients uh, that go into your food products. Um, and you mentioned working with smallhold farmers. Uh, and I know that there's a movement around regenerative agriculture and regeneration that really offers some hopeful ideas for addressing climate. Uh, what is Nestle doing around regenerative agriculture with small farmers? So as part of this plan, uh, we have specifically earmarked uh, an investment of 1.2 billion uh, for the first five years uh, to promote regenerative uh, farming practices. Because yes, uh, we're seeing a very promising um, uh, trend there. And um, it's important that this is one of several initiatives that we have to kick off with our supply chain. There is no, let me just say in general, there is no silver bullet, uh, there is no shortcuts, there's no miracle solutions. So what you have to do is very patient, uh, bottom up work uh, and regenerative farming practices uh, is one of them. As you look at it, uh, clearly a lot of farmer assistance uh, is needed. Um, you know, it's easy for us to kind of um, try out a trend like this, but for a farmer that has to make a decision about, uh, you know, how to sort of approach their, uh, their, their, their field work the next year, this sometimes has uh, pretty much, uh, you know, life or death implications when it comes to surviving uh, in, at the farm level. And hence uh, this whole notion of supporting what we call a just transition, you know, making sure that without excessive risks, farmers can graduate from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. Um, that is gonna be key. Uh, farming communities around the world tend to be conservative. Um, I think for a good reason, because again, each and every time when they try out something new in a big way, uh, they're essentially betting the farm literally. And, uh, and that's not something you wanna lose. And hence uh, providing um, the knowledge assistance, but also providing the economic assist assistance to make that happen is uh, key to us. Terrific. And in addition to working with these hundreds of thousands of smallhold farmers, uh, Nestle, of course, has several hundred thousand employees. And the actions of each one of them is significant in terms of reaching the net zero roadmap goal. How do you imbue a sense of commitment to climate, to the sustainable development goals more broadly throughout such a large global enterprise like Nestle? Look, very important question and a basic comment to go first. Uh, one of the great things about Nestle and its culture and the kind of history I described to you earlier is that um, selling this to the Nestle community was not exactly a hard sell. So this was something that um, uh, was very warmly received because uh, this is how many people feel, what they've seen firsthand when they were dealing with outside uh, constituents. Uh, so it's clearly an area that was met with a lot of enthusiasm inside the company. When you look at it through the role of a leader, you know, there's several ways that of course you can, um, you can approach this. Um, I wouldn't underestimate the power of the sheer public uh, commitments that we've made because clearly people feel a sense of obligation that uh, Nestle rises uh, to the challenge and, uh, and meets those um, uh, goals. Um, then of course, you have to translate these outside goals into internal deployable targets. We have created what we call the ESG deployment group uh, that basically takes those uh, commitments and targets and then breaks them down by commodity, uh, geography, and uh, category type of business, and makes sure that everyone knows what their fair share is. Because otherwise, you know, in a large company that is present in 186 uh, markets and uh, uh, literally dozens of um, uh, different commodities and uh, and more than 10 categories, otherwise uh, everyone would look to everyone else uh, to go the first step. And uh, we have also embedded this in a number of bonus targets, including our executive committee. Uh, and then of course, in a more actionable way further down the line, uh, you know, some of the operating bonus targets. And overall, you need to create a consistent framework here and, and, and set of metrics um, that's uh, important. We're also in the process like so many other companies uh, to improve our overall 
environmental support, um, environmental reporting. Um, as you know, this used to be a fairly unregulated and loose area in the past. I think now there's a lot of investor interest here and um, the standards for the accuracy of that reporting and then also outside verification and, um, and, and, and standardized metrics, all of, all of those requirements are increasing very much and hence uh, we're in the process of upgrading those systems uh, to meet and exceed those requirements. That's terrific. And I do think this idea of incorporating um, uh, sustainability goals into compensation uh, levels and bonuses is something that relatively few companies are doing, but is really tremendously important in my experience toward actually uh, achieving the levels of change that companies uh, want to reach. Um, you know, as, as the largest food and beverage company in the world, uh, you have a real leadership role. Uh, in the industry, uh, not just in terms of your own employees and your own activities, but collaborating with other players in the industry, collaborating with governments, and really uh, leading the charge for other food and beverage companies. How do you see Nestle's global leadership role and its ability to collaborate with others? So clearly, this is a piece of work uh, that we all have to do together. Um, it's sometimes important that uh, individual players and companies take a first step and uh, use that momentum to take others with them. But fundamentally, uh, it also requires a whole lot of uh, vertical and, uh, and uh, horizontal collaboration uh, to get things going. And uh, let, me, let me give you a few examples. So we mentioned reporting. Um, I think if everyone just highlights their success stories and doesn't talk about the things that don't go so well, nothing much gets accomplished. So clearly my vision for the future would be that just like you have an annual report to summarize the financial situation in a fairly standardized way with lots of legal and reputational downside if something's wrong, you should have uh, a similar uh, set of uh, metrics uh, fully endorsed by management with some legal consequence if uh, these numbers aren't right um, on the environmental side and, uh, and social side. And um, I think we're moving towards that direction, but uh, just like it took many years for the financial accounting standards to evolve in that direction, I think it'll also take a bit of time for this to be fully built out, but it's coming. And any, any efforts here by companies to lead in that space are certainly very much appreciated by the more forward-thinking uh, investors. So that's one. Another role I think is around um, uh, regulation. I think regulation is one of the best ways to create a level playing field. Um, as you know, on many of these sustainability uh, topics, there is a constant danger of companies taking a free ride. Um, by the way, looking, and, and, and see, looking at and seeing a free rider for me is never an excuse for not taking action, but it's certainly annoying. And it makes everything so much harder for the companies uh, that want to do the right thing. So in a responsible way to um, work with regulators to create a level playing field for everyone, I think uh, it's an important piece of work uh, that we are fully committed to. That's so that's great. one of the couple examples, yeah. but let me also say, especially on the agricultural side, there's lots of things that we are doing with the agricultural community that we develop and we basically provide it as open source um, insights and help and assistance and there's no strings attached. So that farmer may take that know-how then supply someone else. Frankly, um, we're only happy for that because it's, it's one more step towards uh, scaling up and creating momentum. Um, so that, that's what you're describing as, uh, you know, some of the um, importance here of leading companies, um, you know, creating a pull in that direction. And we're committed to that. Absolutely. And I think that is a, a noble sentiment that whether the farmer is selling to you or someone else, Nestle still has a, a responsibility and an opportunity to help improve practices and reduce some of the consequences for climate change. Well, I know we have a number of questions coming in. I do want to ask you a couple of questions before we turn to the audience, a couple more. Um, we talked earlier about consumer tastes changing, and I know one really interesting area of research and development for Nestle has been alternative proteins and plant-based uh, meats or meat alternatives. And what, what do you see happening in that market and, and what role do you see Nestle playing? Yeah, so look, um, I think this is a 
what I call a once in a generation opportunity to um, rejuvenate and energize our food business. Um, there's clearly a shift underway from uh, animal-based proteins towards indexing higher on plant-based proteins. Especially in the Western world, uh, we index and over-index uh, very much, in particular on meat and dairy consumption. And it's one of those areas where you're seeing public health consequences by people consuming too much of those proteins. And then also, uh, I think there is a greenhouse gas consequence because the production of these animal-based proteins uh, really uh, emits so much more greenhouse gas. So I think there is a real opportunity here on both of these. Uh, we call this good for you, good for the planet. So both of these um, goals are satisfied if we index a little larger on plant-based proteins. We started with um, the food side. Uh, so um, when it comes to beef analogs, uh, chicken products, um, but now actually as we come out with uh, variety after variety, for example, you know, tuna analog, uh, shellfish eventually, and you're seeing that essentially every animal-based protein can be mimicked with, with a very high uh, sense of um, uh, taste and, and, and quality, and also a very good nutritional profile uh, in, in a plant-based fashion. And so that's something we're very committed to. Uh, same thing on uh, dairy uh, alternatives. Uh, so we will always continue to be, you know, a dairy-focused company, but um, I think for those consumers who want to have a good and protein rich plant based alternative, we, you know, we want to be able to provide that not only as the original product, but then also in follow on products. So for example, we use dairy as coffee creamers, we use it now confectionery and ice cream business. And so in all of these categories, uh, people are looking so much more these days for plant based um, alternatives. So to me, uh, it's important not to be a one trick pony. Very often, you know, this whole thing gets reduced to just the question of who makes the best uh, hamburger patty. Uh, that may be an interesting race in and for itself, uh, but um, you know, there's way more to it than just a hamburger patty and, uh, and we're fully committed to that. Sure. And I know that your commitment to healthy and nutritious food is something that actually matters to you personally. And that if I remember correctly, you start the day with a rather nutritious drink. Can you tell us how you start your morning? <laughs> yes. So uh, look, one of my hobbies for a long time and way long before I uh, uh, joined Nestle is uh, I'm a big believer in uh, vegetable and fruit uh, juices, uh, freshly made uh, of smoothies. And um, so I have uh, two machines at home. Uh, one is um, a cold press uh, juicer, the other one is a uh, high powered um, uh, blender. And uh, so normal weekday morning, I would call, you know, it's one of the lower quality products that's only eight to 10 uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Saturday mornings, I use both machines to the full extent and then we're talking between 10 and 20. Uh, but uh, yeah, I love that. And uh, I usually also add some, uh, some source of protein into it. Uh, so that's a little longer lasting, but that's a morning routine I've had for a long time and I love it. Well, that gives me great confidence about Nestle's commitment to nutritional foods if the CEO himself uh, starts his morning that way. Well, we have some terrific questions coming in from the audience. Uh, so let's turn to that. Um, and they're really very thoughtful questions. And so the first question that came in, is ESG considered a value driving strategy or more of a risk mitigation strategy for Nestle? Um. The simple answer is both in the sense that uh, for some premium products, uh, it can actually be a value generator in the sense that more and more of these um, uh, target consumers uh, look at you for a superb environmental footprint as well. And, um, and hence doing this as part of an overall premiumization drive uh, and premiumization is one of the clear winning strategies uh, in our space. I think on the more affordable, um, uh, uh, price segments, there uh, it is more of a risk mitigation strategy in the sense that you don't expect to uh, charge a premium. You also probably won't gain significant market shares, but you basically avoid the loss of them. And, um, and so uh, you're trying to keep that risk as low as possible. Uh, so the answer is both, but uh, the overall case is that um, with the changing consumer, and the changing regulatory landscape, I think there is more and more a 
of a business case emerging that allows you to look at these ESG investments as a forward-looking investment uh, under normal commercial terms. And that's important for me that a company doesn't masquerade uh, to be something else, but rather looks at it as a sound commercial decision. That's terrific. And I think that idea of balancing both is, is absolutely essential. Well, another question has come in about you know, what is a very challenging uh, uh, issue for the company, which is the use of plastic in packaging. And uh, the question is, are you planning to invest in dedicated recycling facilities or research into different mechanical or chemical recycling startups? Or uh, how do you plan to address this global challenge around the use of plastic? Yeah. So let me say this is a, um, a significant problem. It's probably um, one of the top four or five uh, sustainability um, uh, areas that we focus on. It took several decades to build up that problem because uh, if we'd had uh, that same conversation 50, 60, 70 years ago, we would have touted uh, the food safety and shelf life benefits of plastic packaging. And all of those were there, which is why it became so popular. Uh, but then only over time did people see the damage that gets done if that plastic packaging leaks uncontrolled uh, into the environment and, uh, and hence that leads to the situation we're trying to address uh, today. As we're trying to mitigate the problem, um, there's, again, no silver bullets here. Um, there's, I think, a set of different solutions for different uh, categories and different geographies. One, uh, where the systems do exist or can be built up in a short period of time is recycling. And so one of our key commitments is to make our packaging reusable or recyclable by the year 2025. But we know full well that there will be uh, parts of the world where short term, mid term, uh, you will not have uh, the kind of recycling system that really uh, addresses that problem alone. Next one is reuse system. Again, they work better when you have more population density uh, and also a climate that, that doesn't pose uh, too much of a challenge from a temperature and humidity point of view. So reuse systems, uh, we have a number of uh, interesting pilots underway and uh, are eager to scale those up over time to uh, account for a larger share of our uh, revenues. Then there clearly needs to be research into new materials. So materials that give you the essential food safety and shelf life benefits that you want, but that even if they get discarded in an uncontrolled way into the environment, that they degrade faster over time and degrade in ways that they don't leave anything toxic behind. And um, one of the major trends that we're working on, for example, is what we call paperization. So these days, there's a lot more high performance papers out there that give you good protection. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, these products uh, degrade so much faster after use. You know, it's ironic with plastic that you package something that gets consumed when you eat in a few minutes, but then, you know, it literally stays around for decades. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's really made for, uh, you know, something that has longer term uses and not just uh, short term use such as uh, packaging. Another avenue is uh, the sheer reduction in packaging size. I think there was a practice in the past that uh, oversized packaging gives you stronger shelf presence and makes your product more noticeable to the consumer. I think here we're working a lot with um, innovative forward thinking retailers around the world to be sure that we still get the same shelf space and the same attention, but that we actually uh, reduce the packaging as much as possible, no matter what material they're made from. And I think there's lots of economies there from a supply chain point of view. Uh, the shelf management for the retailer is easier because more product fits on the same shelf. For the consumer, there's um, less product to carry home and less waste. So that's another interesting work stream. And then there's lots of behavior changes that I think we all have to go through. And um, that includes also, uh, you know, better reuse um, uh, behaviors and uh, the avoidance of single use plastics and so forth. So we engage in all of these. It's important, um, especially when it comes to the recycling systems and retailers that here we're working again as part of um, a system. And uh, we are also working intensely with regulators to be sure that uh, a level playing field is assured. Again, none of this will ever be used as an excuse from our side that we're not making enough progress, but we want to be sure that everyone sort of moves in the same direction. 
That's terrific. And um, it is indeed a, a multifaceted uh, strategy that's necessary to, to deal with this issue. Um, there's been a number of uh, efforts uh, to monetize social impact, to enable people, investors in particular. Sorry, my dog in the background. Uh, we love to, pets. Uh, we love pets. <laughs> uh, to enable um, investors to be able to compare across companies and really sort of price out the externalities. My colleague, George Serafim, has led a project on what's, what he's calling impact-weighted accounts, where he's actually adjusted the net profit of companies by reasonable approximation of the cost of their externalities. And I think actually Nestle has done relatively well uh, in that adjustment. But do you think about monetizing the social and environmental impacts of your company? Look, we follow uh, quite a bit of the research uh, that's going on there. And I think uh, in the spirit over time of getting to ever better levels of accuracy, um, uh, that may be worthwhile. I think short term, um, the goal is a little different. And that is you have a situation where you roughly define what West means. And then you say, go West. And go West means, uh, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing plastic waste, and uh, a few other key environmental goals. And uh, then as you sort of have done the easy pickings, um, I think then as you get to finer and finer points, and also some interesting trade-offs between a number of environmental goals, then I think you know, these tools and some of these metrics will help you over time uh, to make smarter choices about what to prioritize. At the moment, uh, again, we're still you know, the cowboy in the saddle telling the herd, go west and go west as fast as possible, make that impact, dent the curve. To me, the 2020s is all about denting the curves on some of these things. In this context, for example, on greenhouse gas emissions, it's so important to us, in addition to the roadmap, that we can also see already that we have left uh, peak carbon behind. So according to our calculations, that was 2019. And from now on, we're on a client path down. And, um, and so it's a good thing to have you know, all these goals for 2025 and 2030, but to also see a near term that uh, the nose is pointing down already is, uh, is just very important to me and something that the team and I uh, stay very focused on. That is indeed a, a tremendously important uh, point to bear in mind, uh, and indeed a hopeful one. Um, one of the interesting questions that came in, and I'll, I'll ask this question, and then uh, we're almost out of time, so I want to give you a chance to uh, conclude with whatever final words you want to add. Uh, but the question is, how do you allay the distrust that many people have of large companies, uh, particularly when you come into a new community to harvest natural resources such as water? Uh, sort of how do you prove your good intentions uh, with regard to responsible environmental stewardship? Yeah. So look, um, I know that large companies are sometimes uh, regarded, as you say, with distrust. And um, I think uh, this is where the improved transparency around the world through digital will only help over time. Uh, because I think as you can convince yourself about the facts, and uh, see more of uh, the contributions we can make, I think more and more people will reassess that situation. And um, the one thing that's, uh, that shouldn't be underestimated about large companies is simply uh, the notion of impact at scale. And um, so you hear the tone from the top, you hear what I'm telling you, but then over time, um, through our reporting and through more and more digital tools, I think you will also have a chance to verify and uh, to also see if we're not living up to our principles, uh, you know, you'll hear about that right away. And so I think uh, compared to an age, let's say 20, 30 years ago, where more and more of these things uh, were based on hearsay, I think you know, that fact-based, fully transparent environment um, that um, is here to stay um, uh, through digital, I think that is probably playing in our favor. And um, so that's why it, on most of these questions and metrics, if there is, the choice between something that is more transparent and less. Um, frankly, uh, sunlight is, <laughs> it clarifies a lot of things. And I'm very committed to it. That's great. Well, I, I have to say, I think this is a really inspiring conversation. And I think that um, it would be hard for anyone to doubt Nestle's commitment uh, to the net zero roadmap, uh, to a line of healthy foods, uh, to a positive impact in the environment. 
uh, after listening to you. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. And, and let me hand this back to Bobby for a final word. And thank you so much for a very insightful and engaging conversation. And you know, you've really shown us what a company can do when it has a focused imperative as well as a clear roadmap. So let's all work to put a dent in that curve. Um, so the SVI would really just like to thank you, Mark Schneider and the Nestle team for just being very thoughtful about your approach and sharing your ideas and lessons with us. And Mark Kramer, as always, we're delighted that you are here facilitating this excellent discussion for today. I just wanna give a shout out to the Shared Value Initiative team working behind the scenes to make this happen today. Georgie Eckert, Alicia Dunn, Sam Wallach, and Imani Hicks. And I wanna thank our audience today for being with us. We look forward to seeing you in November at the Shared Value Leadership Summit. Thank you again. Thank you. Bobby, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to you and your team for setting this up. And uh, my best wishes and thank you to the audience for joining us today. Thank you.